Guys, it's Arshan. Welcome. We're going to do a presentation today on the basics of selling stock. Uh, this may not be the presentation you were uh, looking for. It may not be what you thought it was going to be, but it may be exactly the presentation that you need uh, in order to understand what happens when a uh, private company, and that's what we're going to focus on, a private company, uh, wants to sell stock to investors. And we're going to go uh, beyond just a business deal, right? The One of the parts of this is getting a willing buyer and a willing seller, right? You need to have a company that somebody wants to buy the stock in, uh, agree to a price per share, and then sell the shares, right? And if you've ever seen like a shark tank, you know, one of the things they talk about is, you know, what what is the value of the company and what percentage are you getting, right? These are these are fundamental tenets. Um, I want to take a step beyond that and talk about some of the, the legal and compliance stuff that goes into that, right? So you really have an understanding of some of the issues that you need to understand when you're out there uh, selling stock. And this is something that unfortunately uh, most companies don't know. And I believe in the smaller side of scale, you know, most companies don't do uh, and that, that can cause a host of issues. So uh, this is the basics of selling stock. It's just going to really give you an idea of what's out there so that you can make a more informed decision, so that you can be more informed uh, as an executive of a company, as a you know lead owner, a founder, whatever role you might find yourself in. Uh, this will give you some really good ideas of some of the compliance steps uh, that you should be following because they do have legal consequences. Uh, to get things better. Um, as always, this is just a discussion, education, information, uh, get you up to speed, not designed to be legal advice. You know, go consult an attorney, but this will give you the ideas to talk to your attorney about. You'll be a more educated consumer and you'll know what's going on. Um, at the core of, a, uh, of all of this, and we're going to get into selling stock and, and some of the regulatory stuff with it, at the core of it is a business deal, right? You need to have a business deal between the company and an investor on how much stock's being bought and, and what the price is. Uh, that usually means you got to generate a valuation for the company uh, after the what they call a post-money valuation. After the money comes in, what's the valuation of the company? So let's say somebody says, I'm going to pay you a million dollars to own 25% of your company. You would take that 25% and the million dollars, divide the million dollars by 25%, and you, you now know the company is worth at that instant based on that transaction, $4 million. And that would be what some people call a post-money valuation. Uh, so you've got to come up with that. Uh, the simplest version is common stock. The investor comes in, they own some stock, they go along for the ride, uh, they get cashed out at the end, right? And we talked um, in one of our prior videos about forming a corporation, shareholders, directors. Well, those directors, their job is to work for all the shareholders generally, uh, with a duty to protect the company and maximize the value in most states under most corporate codes, right? To really grow the wealth of the company uh, as a kind of a, what they call fiduciary duty. So that's kind of the groundwork. Uh, that's the easiest place to come in. But there's other ways uh, deals can look for stock, right? They can be preferred stock. It can be common stock with, a, with board seats. It could be a lot of different things depending on the business deal between the investor and the company, right? So at the core of this needs to be a business deal, right? Nothing happens without a business deal. Uh, but what are some of the things we need to look at when we're selling stock beyond just, you know, coming up with a willing buyer and a willing seller? And I'm glad to go in that deeper on another video if you're interested, you know, leave me some comments. I will always look at the comments for what other people uh, wanna cover here. So if that's something that a significant number of people are interested in, we can jump into that. Um, this is what somebody told me after I was a practicing lawyer, uh, Securities Law 101. Uh, every transaction is either registered or exempt. And, and that was such a simple statement, but it really frames the world uh, from a compliance standpoint. So securities laws applies to things that are securities. Um, there's a famous test out there called the Howey test uh, from, a, from, from a court case. Uh, and the Howey test essentially looks at what, what the motivation is of, of what's being sold and whether it's a security because the SEC, the Federal Securities and Exchange Commission, and typically the state securities boards, attach to regulating offers of securities. 
uh, selling your car is not a offer of security, right? That's pretty simple. You know, selling your house is not the offer of security, right? You're selling an asset. That's not something that uh, would, would be regulated as securities laws. Uh, but when we start getting into something that has profit attached to it and is connected to the management of the ongoing business, we start looking like a security, right? And there's a lot of nuances to a test about whether something is a security or not. Uh, but it's, you know, think of it as a range, right? On one extreme is just, you know, selling an asset in a one-time transaction, very isolated versus selling ownership of a company where the buyer is clearly uh, participating in a profit. So most companies, if you're selling company interest, you're going to fall within the world of securities law. And then we have to determine whether that security is either registered or exempt, right? Do we take that security and register it with a uh, board or a or, or securities agency, or is it exempt from registration? Now, your typical registration would probably be the SEC. Uh, and there's, you know, once you typically get to a certain size, you can't avoid that. Uh, that's where all your public companies are, right? Big companies end up having to register with the SEC, file with the SEC, keep providing certain information. On the other end, exempt transactions are transactions which uh, don't fall uh, necessarily requiring registration. They fall into what they call an exemption. You are exempt from registration. So you've got to split the world here. Uh, for most smaller companies, the ones that are probably tuning into this video, we're probably talking about an exempt offering. Um, so we first have to figure that out. And there's a number of exemptions available, right? Uh, it's a state and federal system. Uh, there is a concept called uh, preemption, where federal securities law will override or preempt state securities law in certain cases. Uh, so that's usually a good thing because it simplifies your life. Uh, usually, you know, if you're trying to structure a deal, you're going to want to try to apply for one or uh, obtain one exemption or, or work towards one exemption. Um, and then you're going to want that to override the states. If you can get that federal exemption that overrides the state uh, through preemption, you've just saved yourself a lot of paperwork and a lot of problems, right? So it's a state and federal system, uh, dual regulation. Uh, we do see both states. Uh, sets of securities regulators active in looking at transactions, right? So you can't just say it's just a state issue. You can't just say it's just a federal issue. Uh, it could really be either or depending on the nature of the transaction. Uh, but there is preemption. Sometimes the federal system will overtake the state system as far as granting exemptions. Uh, there's a lot of case law there, but in general, states respect that federal exemption when there is preemption. Uh, Going the registered route is generally costly and expensive. And that's why smaller privately held companies don't want to register, right? Um, it's a lot of paperwork. Uh, you may end up in a review process depending on which, which route you go, but you uh, may well end up with a reviewer looking at your registration statement, uh, providing comments, asking you to change things. Uh, it also requires an awful lot of paperwork. Uh, some of the same paperwork you'll end up preparing probably on a protective basis uh, in certain private transactions, particularly you deal with accredited investors. You'll want to give them a lot of that information. Now, if you have non-accredited investors, that's a whole other video there. Uh, if you're dealing with smaller investors, you may still have a lot of paperwork requirements, even with an exemption system. So uh, registration is generally costly. It's generally expensive. It's not what private want companies want to do. So most companies want to go the exemption route. Uh, but here's the start of your analysis, right? Like, uh, can we get an exemption? What conditions do we need to make for to get to that exemption, right? So typically what you want to do is look at the variety of exemptions to securities laws that are available. Uh, and then you're looking at, and there's some nice charts and checklists online. And then you're trying to figure out which category you fall in and what the requirements are to fall underneath that exemption. Uh, there are many available, particularly now. This is something that has been increased over recent years uh, with crowdfunding, with uh, Reg A+. Uh, there are now more uh, categories of registration or either easy registration or exemption that are available. Um, so less and less companies necessarily have to go that full registration, full regulatory route. 
Um, but you need to make sure you understand the exemption system and how you fit in. A good lawyer will help you do that. Um, usually it's uh, smart money to get somebody involved that can kind of walk through this with you. Uh, make sure you're checking the right boxes, preparing any necessary paperwork. Uh, but exemptions are conditional, uh, and meaning that in order to get the exemption, you have to meet the conditions of, ex of the exemption. And if you go to the actual regulations, a lot of these exemptions on the federal level come from what they call Regulation D, uh, which is a series of different exemptions and rules. Uh, but if you go to like Rule 506 uh, in Regulation D, it will spell out what you need to do to get that exemption and similarly for other uh, rules so what you want to do is look at the exemptions and look at the conditions to that exemption and you want to work through the analysis of am i doing the things i need to do to be exempt right so just because there's an exemption there that's good you want to be generally exempt from registration because of the costs and burdens that we talked about earlier but you got to meet the conditions of that exemption, right? You can't just go out and, you know, check a box and say you're exempt. No, you have to be exempt and you have to meet those conditions of that exemption. Uh, you must plan that, right? So, uh, for instance, the old Rule 506, the old version of 506, uh, which is now 506B, so depending on what year you're reading, right? So, you know, if you read 5 eight-year-old articles will talk about rule 506 and now we have five rule 506b and rule 506c two different versions underneath that law but if you go to like 506b uh one of the conditions in there is there can't be a general solicitation right you've got a plan to meet that condition that means you can't be running around telling everybody about your offering 506c the newer version of 506 that allows you to do a general solicitation, but there's checkbox you have to meet there, right? Including you're going to lock yourself out of non-accredited investors. That's why you've got to figure out which path you're going to pursue early on. So you want to make that plan, and then what you want to do is you want to run to that plan. So the very important part of this really is the planning piece. Uh, the execution piece becomes somewhat mechanical. I will say, you know, the securities laws, while... You know, lawyers can always find ambiguities, can always find issues and things. Um, they are well-structured, and if you do advanced planning, uh, it usually is generally easy to structure your transaction such that you can move through and qualify for uh, the exemption. So uh, what you want to do is plan in advance. Um, again, not legal advice, but I hope this is helpful and kind of gives you an idea and gives you some education. Uh, and doesn't scare you away. Um, there are some people that, you know, when they hear these types of things, they have to make one of two choices. They need to decide either, uh, you know, I'm going to comply and I'm going to do the things, or, you know, I, this is this company's not ready. Um, and, and either choice is valid, right? And sometimes I do get companies that say, hey, we're not really ready. Well, these securities laws are designed to protect investors, and they are onerous to deal with. But they do give that layer of protection, which is why they're there, right? So that's why you have to do them. That's why you have to incur the expense and put the time and the energy into uh, doing it. That all being said, one good thing is when you do this correctly, when you do this right, when you prepare this documentation for investors, uh, what you'll find is that you end up doing a lot of the homework and diligence and stuff you should have been doing anyway. So uh, it really is kind of front-loading some of the work makes you work harder on your business plan, makes you uh, pull things together. So um, it really can be a powerful tool in that regard uh, to make things work uh, as a total for your business over the long term. And you can often reuse these documents over time. Um, use the documents you use to disclose to investors uh, when you use an exemption. Your business will evolve. You'll update that, revise it. Uh, generally add detail and clarity as your company gets bigger. You can use that again and again and again to where, uh, if you're doing it right, all the way up to someday when you might be a registered company, you could still be using pieces and portions of that work you did early on. So uh, that is the real benefit of getting the started up. It becomes a sub-process in your business, just like your bookkeeping function, just like your HR function, uh, your 
stock offering, investor relations, securities compliance can become a function of your business. And that's really what you want to aim for if you have raising money as part of your long-term plan for your business. Folks, I hope that's helpful. Look forward to reading your comments below. Thanks for tuning in today. Um, I hope you subscribe to the channel. Catch you soon.